Hi again. We're going to look at ionic compounds again in this lesson, but this time uh, with a slight difference. The metal that is involved in this ionic compound is going to be a multivalent metal. In other words, we're going to look at ionic compounds whose metal ions uh, can have more than one possible charge. And so we need to be specific when we name these types of ionic compounds that contain multivalent metals in order to identify which ion we're referring to. And to, let's talk about that a little bit before we go ahead and do some examples. Um, so you'll notice on your periodic table of elements that in the center of the table you have your transition metals and many of these metals have more than one possible charge. So for example if I have a look at nickel that's in group 10, I see that in the top right hand corner I have 2 plus and 3 plus written in my periodic table. Those numbers refer to the possible charges that nickel can have when it forms an ion. So nickel can lose two electrons, a neutral atom of nickel can lose two electrons and become a nickel um, ion with a two plus charge, or it could lose three electrons and it could become nickel three plus. So there's more than one possible ion that can be formed from a neutral atom of nickel. Uh, the same is true of all of the other um, uh, metals in your periodic table that have more than one charge listed. One thing that I will note, this table has been taken from science, the Science 10 um, data booklet that's provided to students for the provincial exam uh, and it's used throughout the course in Science 10 and I've, we've included it here in Chemistry 11 because it's a great table and it's really useful because it has the ion charges on it. One thing you should note is that these are the common ion charges, meaning that um, these are the possible ions that are formed, um, that are most commonly formed. So it is possible that some of these um, multivalent metals could have one more uh, possible ion charge, but uh, that ion ex uh, does not um, exist very frequently. So it, it's it's rare, and so it's not included on the on this periodic table. But you can find some periodic tables that will actually list more ion charges than, than what you see here. But for our purposes in this course, these are the common ion charges that we see, and these are the ones that we're going to work with. And you're not expected to know anything more than what's on your periodic table th that you're provided with in this course. Um, so Let's go ahead and, um, and try some examples now. Naming ionic compounds that contain multivalent metals. The naming system is still the same. We always write the metal first, followed by the non-metal. But remember, as we learned in our last lesson, the non-metal needs to have that IDE ending added to it or changed. And the other thing that we need to remember now, and this is new, is we're going to identify what ion we're talking about for the metal. So the metal cation, because there's more than one possibility, it has to be clearly stated in the name. And we use Roman numerals to indicate the charge. Okay, um, so for example, you know, four uh, would have the Roman numeral four to indicate that that metal has a four plus charge. So this is going to be the charge on the metal. That's why it's written directly after the metal. We put it in brackets and we also write the charge in Roman numerals instead of writing just a four. Okay, after the metal. So let's go ahead and do some of these examples. And I'm going to uh, start with naming. So we're given the formula. From the formula we have to write the name. Um, and before with a simple ionic compound, this is really simple because you just wrote it exactly how you saw it. You would look up the metal, write the name, look up the non-metal, write the name, and change the ending. Now we have to include this Roman numeral, or show the charge on the metal in Roman numerals, so we have to think a little bit more about um, what charge we have on the metal, and in doing that we have to use our swap and drop or crisscross method, and we have to work backwards. So I'm going to show you that route. The other thing I'm going to uh, work through with you is uh, the mental math um, approach to naming. Because we talked about that in the last lesson, you might find it easier to think about how many of each ion you need just thinking about it uh, mentally, using common sense, and thinking about 
the fact that the the ion charges need to balance each other out and so I will use both methods then hopefully one of those will will um, really click with you so let's go ahead and start this this uh, first example we've got Fe 3 N 2 so the first thing I recognize is that this is ionic because Fe is a metal and N is a non-metal but I need to find their names okay and then the next thing I need to do is figure out the charges on them so Fe is found in the center and under group 8 and the name of Fe is iron it could have a 3 plus or a 2 plus charge and N is found on the right hand side and its name is nitrogen which I need to change the ending to nitride okay and it has a 3 minus charge so let's go ahead and write that out so we've got uh, iron and I'm going to leave brackets for my Roman numerals and I do need to put a number in there, but I haven't figured it out yet. And then I'm going to write the name of the non-metal, which is nitrogen. And remember that you have to change the ending on the nitrogen to IDE when it's in a compound. So nitride will be the proper um, way of writing my non-metal. And finally, I need to figure out what is this charge on iron. And there are two ways to do that. So the first way is to use the swap and drop method. And this time, we're actually going to bring our charges back up. So we're going to uncrisscross our charges. So I'm going to bring up the 3 above the nitrogen and all nonmetals have negative charges and I'm going to bring up the 2 so that it's now written up above the iron and it will have a positive charge because it's on a metal. So all I've done here is I've just reversed or uncrisscrossed my charges. I've brought them back up. And now before I assume that I have it written correctly, I just need to double check the charge on my non-metal. Remember that your non-metals over here only have one possible charge. So you just need to verify that the charge you have written, okay, in this case 3 minus, 3 or negative 3, is the correct charge. And if it's not, you need to multiply it by a number so that you have the correct charge. Okay, so here 3 minus is the correct charge on nitrogen, so I know it's, it's written correctly. Okay, which means then this is balanced and iron has a 2 plus charge. So the charge on iron is 2 plus, but I can't write that as a, a number in my name. I need to write it as a Roman numeral, so 2 is simply 2 lines. You can write it like that, or you can put uh, a top and bottom on it, and there you've got iron 2 nitride is the name of this compound. Using the mental math method, let's do that just before we move on. Okay, um, so again, if I instead of uncrisscrossing the charges, if I had not done that, so I'll just go back to what I had, which was Fe3N2. If I'd taken a different approach here, what I could have done is I could have said, well, I've got three irons and I've got two nitride ions. I know that. So let's write those out. I've got three Fe's. And that is going to balance with two nitrogens. Or, sorry, nitride ions. And I looked up nitrogen and we noticed that it had a three negative charge. So altogether, on the non-metal side, I have an overall charge of negative 6. Over here then, on the metal side, I need to have that charge be balanced. So this needs to be equal to positive 6. So really the question then is, <clears throat> what is the charge on each individual iron, or iron ion if altogether three of them have to give me 6 plus? And so the answer is going to be 2 plus. They each need to have a 2 plus charge because 3 times 2 gives me 6. And if you look at your periodic table, your options for iron would have been 3 plus or 2 plus. And so I could see here that if, I, they, if it was iron 3 plus, that would give me a total of 9 plus, which would be too high, and it wouldn't be balanced. So I know that iron has to be iron 2 plus. So both methods, uh, you can either criss uncrisscross your charges or use the mental math method, and both are very effective. Let's do another example here. We've got RuO2. So again, first step is find your elements on the periodic table, make sure it's ionic, 
Uh, and then once you've, you've done that, double check that the metal is, uh, what kind of metal it is. Is it multivalent or not? So I'm looking up RU on my table and I find it right underneath iron and its name is ruthenium. It is multivalent. There's a 3 plus or a 4 plus possible charge on that ion so I need to use Rom Roman numerals to indicate the co correct charge. So I'm going to write in the name of my metal is ruthenium and I'm going to leave some brackets for my Roman numerals and then my nonmetal is oxygen Okay, that has a 2 minus charge. And remember that when you're writing oxygen, we're going to change that ending to IDE. So this is written as ruthenium oxide as opposed to oxygen. Finally, I need to figure out what is my charge on the ruthenium. Okay, what is that charge? And to do that, I can either use the mental math method or I can use my swap and drop method where I I'm going to do the opposite and bring my charges back up. So let's do that. We're going to bring this 2 up first and it'll become a 2 plus. And I've got a little invisible 1 written after my ruthenium in the formula and I bring that 1 up above the 2 and I change it okay, to negative 1. Before I finish, I have to double check the charge on my non-metal. Go back to your periodic table and ask yourself, does oxygen have a negative 1 charge? If not, you need to adjust it. So let's look at oxygen. It does not have a negative 1 charge. It has a two, negative 2 charge. So when I come back here, this needs to be 2 minus. In other words, I need to multiply this by 2, and I need to multiply this positive ion by 2. Okay, So I need to, across the board, multiply my charges by 2 so that I have the correct charge, which would be 2 minus on the oxygen, and that will make a charge of 4 plus on the ruthenium. So my answer here will be ruthenium 4 oxide because ruthenium has a 4 plus charge and I need to use the Roman numeral for that which is 1 before 5 or 1 before the V. There's 4 and there's my final answer. Before I move on I want to just go back and look at that mental math method again. So if this swap and drop method isn't working for you, that's fine. Think about it just in terms of mental math, bit of common sense. So use the formula that you're given and draw it out. You've got one ruthenium atom with a charge that you don't know yet. Okay? And you have two oxygen atoms because of this little subscript 2 in the formula. That tells me there's two of them. And when you look up oxygen on your periodic table, you see it has a 2 minus charge. Or a negative 2 charge. So we've got 2 negative and 2 negative here. So these need to balance each other out, which means that if on the non-metal side I have an overall charge of negative 4, then over here I must have a charge of positive 4 on my one ruthenium ion. And therefore I know what my charge is that I put it, and I put it in brackets in the name. More than one way to, uh, to approach this. So naming here is actually the more difficult step. <laughs> the opposite is true when it comes to writing the formula. This is so easy. Uh, all we have to do here is write the, <coughs> write the um, symbols and we're told the charge on the metal because it's written in Roman numerals. And then we just have to look up the charge on the non-metal and then we can do our swap and drop or crisscross our charges. So here we have vanadium, selenide, Again, always double checking that it's ionic. I know it is ionic. The hint is that I have the, uh, the Roman numerals written um, in my name. That's a little hint. But certainly we can still go back to a periodic table and just make sure we do have a, a metal and a non-metal. Okay, and we're going to look up the symbols while we do that. So the first one is uh, ruthenium, or sorry, vanadium. Vanadium, um, I'm looking for that in the names and I see it, it's right here, it's in group 5. Vanadium, okay, so it has the symbol V and I know it has the 5 plus charge because that's given to me in the name. Okay, so remember that V is the Roman numeral for 5. So I've got vanadium, 5 plus, and I'm looking for selenide. Remember that your name has been changed when, you, when it's written for the non-metal. So I'm not looking for selenide on the table. I'm looking for selenium. 
and I see selenium is right here and it has a negative 2 charge. Uh, and so, and it's simple as S, E, and there it's a negative 2. So I'm ready to swap and drop. I'm going to bring down the 5, and I'm going to bring down the 2, and I can get rid of them now in the ion charges because uh, ionic formula never has any charges in it. So my final answer here, if I can't reduce the numbers, which I can't, will be V2 SE5. And there is my final answer. Let's do another one. We have platinum 4 oxide. So again, looking up the elements, what are their symbols, and then the charges. Well, this charge is given to me, but I do, do need to look up the charge on oxygen. So I've got platinum. I'm going to look that up. Here it is. It's in group 10. PT is the symbol. Oxygen is in group 16. It has a symbol of O and a two, negative 2 charge. So I have platinum PT4 plus oxygen negative 2. I'm going to bring down those charges, bring down my 4, bring down my 2. And I before I write that out, I have to ask myself, could I reduce that? Could I simplify that? And I can. Um, both 4 and 2 are divisible by 2. So I can divide this by 2 and I can divide this subscript by 2. I'm going to clean it up and reduce it if I can. And so my final answer is going to be just platinum, just 1, and I don't need to write the 1 in the formula. Oxygen 2, subscript 2. Okay, so I've cleaned that up and there's my final answer. Again, if this, if this is not intuitive for you, or you don't like this shortcut method, you can go back to that mental math method, which is um, simply without look, without swapping and dropping. So if I don't swap and drop, I just say to myself, well, if I have platinum with a 4 plus charge and oxygen with a negative 2 charge, I need to have one more oxygen with that negative 2 charge in order to balance out the platinum. Okay, so 4 plus will be balanced by 4 minus or 4 negative, and so I must have 2 non-metal oxide ions. And there's my formula. We'll do one more example together. Gold 3-phosphide. Um, I, like, I like to use gold in our example only because uh, it's got a different um, symbol uh, that is derived from its Latin name. And so when you look up gold on your periodic table, you will find it. Oh, I've got it blocked here, so let me just take off my marker. So here's gold, it's in group 11, and AU is the symbol for gold. So I've got AU, and notice that the charge is given to us here, it's 3 plus. Sorry, that's not a, <laughs> that's not a negative sign, 3 plus. Okay, and phosphide is phosphorus, and I'm looking for that on my periodic table. I will find it. It has the symbol P, and it has a 3 minus charge. Here's phosphorus right here in group 15 underneath nitrogen. So, another good example of swap and drop, because when I bring those charges down, bring down my 3, and I bring down my other 3, Again, I see that I can reduce this because both of these are divisible by 3. So this formula is going to be gold subscript 1, which I don't write, and P phosphide subscript 1, which I don't write. So I can reduce that to AUP. Okay. And again, if you don't like that swap and drop method, just simply use some common sense and mental math and recognize that gold with a 3 plus charge is already balanced with only one phosphorus uh, or phosphide ion with a 3 minus charge. So you don't need to go any further than this. Okay, 1 to 1 ratio and therefore your formula uh, will not contain any subscripts. Excellent. Keep practicing with these. Just remember uh, to give a really, really quick summary. When you're dealing with these ionic compounds now, they contain metals, um, the first thing we need to do is 
just check that it's ionic. And by that I mean double check that you actually do have um, either a metal and a non-metal, and later we're going to talk about polyatomic ions, but you want to double check that you're not dealing with two non-metals because that is not an ionic compound. So we check that it's ionic, and then we check the metal. And we ask ourselves, does the metal have more than one charge? So is it a multivalent metal? And if it is, if it's no, okay, then we do not need brackets. But if it has more than one possible charge, we must write the charge in brackets and in Roman numerals. And that's, and that's really the, the only two things that we need to check when we're looking at these ionic compounds up till now. Good luck as you try some of these practice questions.